I want to welcome everyone to our Community Conversations lecture. My name is Dr. Lisa Wisniewski. I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology here at Goodwin University, and I will be uh, facilitating our conversation today, um, and we're going to be focused on global health. Um, so first, I just want to welcome you to our session, and thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon, and I hope you're having a great Friday afternoon. Um, how our lecture will be today is we will hear from our speaker. She will lecture about the topic, share some of the insights, and then there will be a opportunity to ask some questions and engage in discussion at the end of the lecture. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to write them in the chat box um, while she's presenting or after I will ask the questions of our speaker. Um, and for right now, I want to introduce our speaker to you. And uh, please welcome Dr. Dr. Mita Saxena to our conversation today. As a quick introduction, uh, Dr. Mita Saxena is a adjunct professor and teaching fellow at the University of Bridgeport in the College of Health Sciences, where she teaches health economics and U.S. policy and global public health. She is also an ACUE certified instructor and adjunct professor at C CSCU. Her published research focuses on media framing of infectious diseases and U.S. public opinion. Her current research centers on addressing gender inequalities and global health security reg regimens and domestic laws and compliance with international health regulations during public health emergencies of international concern. She has presented her research at professional academic conferences, including IESA, ISA, and APHA. Dr. Saxena, thank you so much for joining us here today and for sharing your um, lecture on this topic. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you for that introduction. And um, hello, everyone. And uh, I can begin now. Wonderful. Uh, we'll just need one moment to transition to pull up the PowerPoint and then Dr. Saxena will share um, her lecture. Thank All you. right, so, so uh, today's topic is what does health mean in the global context? And the focus here will be One Health, a collaborative and transdisciplinary perspective to bringing about global health. So uh, two things before I begin or as I introduce uh, the topic. First, what is health? And what is the global that we are talking about? These are really important. And after I uh, talk about what is health and what is uh, global health, I am going to talk about the burden of diseases, mainly communicable diseases and the non-communicable diseases, and uh, in particular about the zoonotic diseases, which leads us to the, you know, how to solve these problems and to the One Health perspective. And um, how has it been implemented globally and uh, locally and nationally and what are the challenges that lie ahead? So um, what, what does health mean? You know, after the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this is a top of the conversation. And um, if we go by the WHO uh, resolution and definition of health, it means not just absence of disease, but it also means uh, the social, mental, physical health, and a complete well-being of the individual. And that also brings us to what are called the social determinants of health. All right, so if health is beyond diseases and absence of diseases, what are the social determinants, the political, economic, cultural, personal, behavioral, governance uh, determinants of health, the entire concept of social determinants of health, and which also means we need good health outcomes, which we measure on various indicators, uh, what are, and 
it also leads us to the entire question of health for all or universal health coverage, which means a fairness of contribution and a very, very important concept of health equity or removal of all those unfair and unjust uh, societal governance factors that come in the realization of health. So we are taking this very holistic concept of health uh, with uh, social determinants and with health equity and, of course, uh, you know, reducing the burden of diseases, which is a very important part. And, and that brings us to the next slide, which is what is global for us. And um, as you can see here, we are all of us, the human beings, the environment in which we live, and animals, domesticated, pet, wildlife, and, and everything that is here, whether it is all the humans, and when we are talking of the globe, we are talking of humans, each one of us connected or interconnected uh, with the other. And uh, all this is really what we also call our biodiversity. Um, our nature, our environment, uh, the climate, the weather, the insects, the marine life. Um, and uh, in, in humans, we are talking about people from all colors, races, low income, low middle income, middle, high, and high income countries. And all this is really important to the entire conversation on global health and one health. And um, this health, of course, also, and this world comes with its share of challenges. And there's a little more to the global, which we will see in our next slide. All right. So while we live in a world of animals and human beings and um, the climate and the environment, we also live, and we should never forget, and um, as uh, something that uh, international relations scholars really focus on, that the central units in any um, global, in our uh, global world, are the states. And states are also sovereign states. So, you know, for simplifying, it's all the countries in the world that you are seeing here on the globe. And, and each country is sovereign. It has internal sovereignty. It is the supreme lawmaking body. And it has external sovereignty. So it has defined borders, population, government, and uh, we cannot enter any other borders without the other person's permission. If one does that, it's an act of war. We, we are seeing something like that happen. And of course, it is also a world with distribution of capabilities or there's a hierarchy in the world. So while each country or each state is supreme and sovereign and, uh, and and to many, to a large extent, there is the sameness. There are countries with different capabilities, and a significant feature. And and all this is really important to this concept of one health and the policies that we implement is the concept of anarchy. Anarchy in international relations does not mean chaos or lawlessness. It means lack of a world government. It means lack of a world government, and which also means that all the international treaties, all the intergovernmental organizations, all the transnational organizations, including the UN or the WHO um, organizations that we are going to talk about are all voluntary associations to bring about cooperation in a world of sovereign states. So while we are to a large extent driven by and integrated by forces of globalization, 
uh, culture, communications, internet, trade, technology, finance, uh, capital, um, through education. It's, it's a complicated world. It's a complicated world with all these interconnectedness, with all this integration, with all these dependencies, with complex supply chains. It is also a world with sovereign nation states and uh, which are sovereign and do have a mind of their own. They have their own policies. And, and this is the one world that we are living in. So we have made our world a little more complicated now, you know, from the uh, countries, intergovernmental organizations, the animal world, the planets, uh, you know, the waters, the marine life, and, and the human beings and the countries of which we are citizens and the laws by which we abide. And, and, and it is in this big world where we cooperate. So we just saw the global uh, pandemic and we saw tremendous cooperation. We saw tremendous cooperation um, in terms of vaccine development, scientific exchange, um, uh, exchange of information, but we also saw challenges. We, we saw, you know, countries putting themselves first. Um, we saw, uh, you know, vaccine nationalism. Um, we saw disruptions um, in supply. We, we saw trade barriers being erected. We saw a lot of nationalism vis-a-vis -vis the globalism. And, and to a large extent, we, we did see how our international organizations, whether it is the war in Ukraine or whether it is the COVID-19 pandemic, um, they have their limited role. And, and it is this world that, uh, you know, we are really part of this world and uh, our health is to be seen in this particular context. This is the world, and this is the world in which we want to achieve health. And, and, and so we can uh, move to the next slide. All right, so this is um, a map here, and uh, this is a um, uh, you know, when we are talking of health and one of the, the factors that uh, we put a lot of emphasis was on infectious uh, diseases and diseases. Now, this is a map of the global spread of SARS, of the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And this is an important point to begin because this was in many respects, in many ways, the first global disease with tremendous health implications. It had tremendous health implications. We can see how it started in the Guangdong province of China um, and um, how it spread um, in a matter of hours throughout the world. And, and, and this is important because it, it gave a lot of emphasis. And here we, uh, the first time we are seeing the beginnings of a disease, which is, which causes, of course, death. Uh, it caused uh, a lot of um, health problems, uh, particularly the health professionals and people infected. Um, it also raised um, a lot of security concerns. Uh, it raised uh, human rights concerns, you know, when we are isolating people, when we are quarantining people, um, you know, there were um, daily wage workers, uh, there was violation who, who were losing their livelihoods, there were health professional workers, uh, you know, who, who were actually at the front lines, and um, so there, there were there were civil and political rights which were violated when it came to um, quarantine and isolation, and uh, 
And of course, there were tremendous economic losses, trade, travel, industry, all the outshoring, offsourcing. And so we, this was really a starting point in 2003 um, when we see the beginnings of uh, the burden of uh, diseases and health really acquiring beyond the biomedical perspective a larger understanding of what a disease itself is. Uh, it, it is a biomedical issue. It is a human rights issue. It is a security issue. And it is an economic issue. And, and the world could not do much about it. While it, it was contained in, in the next three months, but this was an eye opener for the world. And we can go to the next slide. And uh, of course, uh, this is quickly uh, to give you uh, a view of the global burden of uh, diseases. This is data from the IHME website. We also see the blue is the non-communicable diseases and in the red are the communicable diseases. And these are what we call injuries or falls. And, and, and we see a larger proportion of NCDs than the communicable diseases, because if we change this data, the burden of communicable diseases or infectious diseases falls a lot more on developing countries and low income countries. Because this was the scenario until 2019. And what, and then of course, we became totally not so stumped, but we faced the biggest pandemic, which we will see in the next slide. And, and here, you know, for all the distinction between non-communicable and communicable diseases, we are really focused on deaths caused by COVID. You know, the number of cases, the number of deaths. Uh, this is, again, data from our world and data uh, <clears throat> maintained uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the University of Washington in Seattle. And, and we are seeing that uh, COVID-19 is a communicable disease. And, and it's, um, it's at this point what we also see uh, a merging of the two concepts because um, COVID-19 impacted those people who had more non-communicable diseases or comorbidities as they were, as they were called. And uh, <clears throat> whether it was diabetes, blood pressure, uh, and, and so on. So all this... Uh, further burdened the individual and became more fatal. So here, communicable diseases need a host response. And uh, we see that the entire concept of uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases and disease and all its ramifications is becoming big when it comes to the pandemic. And, and we move to the next slide. And um, you know, this is a time when there is particularly, as I as I mentioned about all the different framings or representations of health issues, um, communicable diseases became very important with the pandemic. And uh, not just is there a threat of naturally occurring diseases, but also the threat of bioterrorism or even the lab leak theory, which has become very uh, significant even with COVID. And, and it became a threat to global security. It became a threat to global security, to human beings for the morbidity, mortality, disability, to the violation of human rights, uh, human security. State security began being threatened. Uh, state capacity, governance, economic losses, and international security, we, we saw trade wars, uh, we see conflicts, and all these are becoming very important. So, you know, health in a global world is, is everything was amplified by the pandemic. And we can go to the next slide. And um, this is, um, um, you know, uh, uh, a chart which shows the WHO declarations of public health emergencies of international concern. Uh, while we all know COVID-19 on 
uh, January 30th was declared to be a public health emergency of international concern under the international health regulations, which were formulated or revised rather after the SARS pandemic. So it gives WHO the ability to declare a public health emergency if there is an extraordinary threat to security. However, it was not the first one. We've had a swine flu in 2009, 2014 Ebola, 2019 again Ebola, 2014 polio, 2016 Zika, and, and the latest PHEIC was the MPOX in 2022. Now, there is something common here. And this is what we call that all these diseases have their origins. And this brings us to really the center of what we call the zoonotic diseases. Um, and so what is a zoonotic disease and, and where does it lead to One Health? Uh, with this background, we go to the next slide. So in 2022, the WHO has come up with these diseases with pandemic potential. A uh, Nipah virus, uh, Congo fever, Lassa fever, Rift Valley, Zika, Ebola, MERS, SARS, and disease X. We don't know. And what we know is that the most newly emerging diseases are all diseases which have spilt over from animals. And, and so whether it was the HIV AIDS whether it was MERS, uh, whether it was all these um, uh, diseases which were declared as public health emergencies, what we see is that they are spilling over from animals. And uh, mainly from wildlife, as we see here, uh, there are intermediary hosts, which is the more of the domesticated uh, animals. And of course, uh, it leads, it, it transfers to the human beings. <clears throat> Not all zoonotic diseases cause diseases in human beings, but many of them are. And 75% of the new emerging or what we call, and also the re-emerging diseases, which is diseases which emerge in one part of the world and then become a problem in another part of the world after many years. So uh, what we are seeing in this, in this globe that uh, we are interconnected and uh, you know, the, the entire issue of zoonotic diseases is becoming very important and we can go to the next slide. And uh, here I want to just give you a few examples of um, zoonotic diseases. Uh, they could be caused by uh, various uh, pathogens. Pathogens are microorganisms uh, which cause uh, diseases. They could be uh, bacteria, they could be viruses, they could be protozoa, they could be fungi. And um, just a few examples of some diseases. The United States, we deal a lot with salmonella, uh, uh, bovine tuberculosis. Uh, you know, the host animals are poultry, pigs, cattle, uh, elephants, rabbits. Uh, they, they could be foodborne uh, by droplets in air. Uh, most of the influenzas, almost all influenzas, um, you know, no matter what the <clears throat> the strain is, whether it was Ebola, HIV, Mpox. Again, the hosts are bats, chimps, monkeys. Uh, they cause death, sickness, skin lesions, um, air droplets. Uh, they could be spread through body fluids, sexually transmitted. Then, of course, there are these neglected tropical diseases. We call them neglected tropical diseases because, um, you know, they, they are in regions of the world which are poor, um, where uh, these diseases are very common. Um, there's little interest of the pharmaceutical industry in developing vaccines or, or uh, cures for them. And yet, as we saw, our world is interconnected. And, uh, uh, you know, there are many ways in which uh, 
the diseases can not just infect, uh, uh, move from the animals and to the other. And therefore, we can go to the next slide. And uh, this is again, and this leads us really uh, to, and all the background that I have given to you leads us to the concept of, so what is our solution? Uh, one health approach. So th this is health in a global context is we have to take care of everyone's health. And uh, from aquatic, animal, environment, plant, food production, and human health, as we go to the next slide. And uh, just an example here to uh, show you how these zoonotic diseases spread. So this is the Zika virus. Uh, we all know it causes microcephaly. Um, and it again, it's it started with some primates and chimpanzees. In Africa, um, 77, we see them in Pakistan, Malaysia. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, again, in 1978, uh, it kind of disappears. We see a little bit in Indonesia, again, appearing in Africa and, uh, you know, moving to the Cook Islands. And, and then 2014, it becomes big as it moves to Brazil and the Americas. And uh, it's a vector-borne disease. Um, and uh, also a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, climate change, weather patterns, all this lead to it becoming big. And uh, it, it became a public health emergency of international concern. You can see in the next slide a, a little more of it. And here again, this is a slide that shows that how all these, uh, you know, how it transfers within animals, what is the urban cycle it takes, and then human to human transmission through um, blood transfusion, sexual intercourse, and closed body, and, and through mother to child. And we go to the next slide. This is again a slide on the Ebola virus. So Ebola was again a public health emergency of international concern. We see how it again jumps species from mammals to bats, which are the reservoirs. Um, there is uh, wildlife hunting and uh, bush meat eating, and then it gets transferred to human beings. Now, our next slide. Uh, Nipah virus. Uh, Nipah virus is particular mainly in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, again, a very it's, it's very high case fatality rates. Uh, that is the number of people who get the disease and the number who die is pretty high. Uh, first identified in Malaysia, uh, pigs, uh, bats. Uh, if, even if there's a fruit that the bat has eaten and there's a human being who eats it, it gets uh, transmitted. So this is, uh, it, it was big in India, fruit bats are the hosts. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, again, this is a slide on the spread of the avian flu, a bird flu. Uh, we all know that uh, the bird flu, uh, you know, we still don't see a lot of human to human transmission, but uh, people who work in close contact with poultry or livestock, there are cases of them getting it. I think in 2022, there was one um, confirmed case in the United States, but the swine flu was again a public health emergency of international concern. Again, we see that there are viral diseases, origins in poultry, and, uh, you know, this is again an example And the next one. And of course, this is the coronavirus transmission cycle. Um, a not so pleasant picture of the uh, wet markets, um, which are said to be the, the places where coronavirus emerged. So again, coronavirus is a zoonotic disease from wildlife to bats, um, uh, to intermediate hosts, human and human to human transmission. So go to the next slide. And uh, 
uh, you know, this is, again, just a picture on, uh, as we come to what, what are the factors which are driving this uh, One Health concern? And we can go to the next slide. All right, so here, uh, what I have for you is, now that's a question that um, a number of us keep asking, right? So what happened? Why are we seeing a rise of uh, zoonotic diseases? Um, and, and what is important here is a number of factors. And, and to a large extent, human beings are also responsible for it. Uh, uh, climate change. Uh, there are, uh, you know, all the weather patterns, the, the global warming uh, change in um, ocean temperatures. All this is changing the pathways of uh, mammals, of migratory birds. Of course, uh, we cannot miss man-made disasters, whether it is a natural disaster like an earthquake we just witnessed, or it is a complex humanitarian emergency like the war in Ukraine, which we are seeing. Then of course, the breakdown of our public health systems. Uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 has brought a renewed focus because these are the systems which actually deliver healthcare. And if, if they do not have the adequate capacities, um, the tools, the diagnostics, the workforce, and enough funding and even access of people to that healthcare, uh, public health systems also become one of the major reasons why we are seeing the you know, emergence of these diseases and human to human uh, transmission. And of course, then there are the uh, what we call the commercial determinants. Um, in commercial determinants, a major factor is billions and billions of dollars of legal and illegal animal trade and of wildlife trade also. And uh, uh, you know, also uh, there there are uh, the role of pharmaceuticals. Uh, drugs not equally accessible to people. As we saw in non-neglected uh, tropical diseases, we do not have enough research and funding coming there. Um, the rise, uh, and uh, as we are more and more deforestation, more and more illegal mining, more urbanization, uh, the food sources are getting depleted um, and uh, there is more poverty and all this leads to further going inside the forests, uh, killing of animals and the way we eat our food. A very, very significant point here is the antimicrobial resistance, which is really important is that most of these protozoa viruses and bacteria are because of um, the way antibiotics have been used freely and generously in many parts of the world without adequate diagnostics, um, they are becoming resistant to it. And I would say this is becoming one of the biggest threats, um, antimicrobials, antibiotics, uh, and, and then the viruses are mutating as they are mixing with different hosts and uh, you know, wildlife migration. So all these uh, factors are really leading to greater zoonotic diseases. We go to the next slide. And, and this is what really brings us to what is the solution? All right, so here are all the problems. What are the solutions? The solution really is in the form of One Health, uh, where we, with the focus on zoonotic and NTDs, we focus on animal, human health, and the entire ecosystem, the biodiversity and sustainable uh, development goals, which as we all know, all 17 of them deal with health uh, directly or indirectly. And, and therefore what we call One Health is not just this, but also collaboration across disciplines, uh, cooperation across sectors, 
uh, the various policies, programs, legislation, which I'm going to come to uh, for, and let's not forget our ends, health outcomes, um, health security, and equity in health. This is what we want. And so this is like one picture which sort of uh, um, says what One Health is about. And I, I will give you a few examples as I, as I move forward. We go to the next slide. And um, here are some uh, global initiatives. So uh, what has the world been doing about it? So as we know, the first, and this is something that I briefly mentioned, which is uh, uh, the international health regulations in 2005, the biggest step, the one major step in uh, you know, managing international spread of infectious diseases and from which the PHEIC was born, actually, and interestingly, did not mention zoonotic diseases. So you know there there is the, there is not much mention of zoonotic diseases despite the big history but they do expand the number of diseases which are controlled um the international health regulations um uh, really focused on uh, building country health systems reporting of infectious diseases um, as they were happening in other countries and once they were reported there was a whole lot of legislation and policies that the World Health Organization and WHO A had come agreed to. And in 2009, what we have is the United States predict, this is very important in the surveillance of infectious diseases and predicting where the next pandemic will be. Uh, 2011, a very important thing is the pandemic influenza preparedness framework. This is a global initiative, again, for One Health, particularly focusing on influenza and influenza strains. So uh, something that I want to uh, point out here is something really interesting happened around this time. Um, there was, as, as we all know, Southeast Asia is, is, is the region where we see the maximum cases of bird flu and avian flu. And of course, uh, since the health uh, in any remote part of the world, we are dependent on it because of our interconnectedness. There was a rush to, uh, you know, develop a vaccine and, uh, you know, for our own livestock and poultry. And also just in case there was a human to human uh, transmission. And uh, so we needed the viruses uh, to unlock their genome sequence. And uh, when the World Health Organization and the, the pharmaceuticals asked Indonesia, which had seen the maximum number of cases of influenza, uh, please share our sam your samples with us. And um, Indonesia said, no, we are not going to share samples we are a sovereign state. We have viral sovereignty. We control the viruses. And because if you share the viruses and you unlock the genome sequence, you will develop medications and antivirals and vaccines, which will all go to the developed world. We are not going to get them. And um, and this is when this pandemic influenza preparedness framework was for, formed, where uh, the country countries agreed to share their viral samples and also to uh, you know make sure that all low and poor income countries also get their share of vaccines and treatments. This has been 2014, the global health security agenda spearheaded by the United States multi-sectoral um, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, a three-point thing, prevention, detection, and response. They would work in different countries. They had action packages. They had uh, a JEE joint external evaluation where, uh, and, and the United States would help all countries basically uh, revamp their um, health systems. And then, of course, um, 2015 Global Action Plan for Microbial Resistance, 
2017, very important. With One Health becoming prominent, the FAO, WHO, OIE, which is now GOA, and, and um, they're all talking about, uh, you know, bringing about a tripartite health. And of course, as, as we all know, there's uh, discussions going on about a pandemic treaty to either replace IHR, uh, <clears throat> which will make it more binding on states, more enforceable. And this does talk of the zoonotic disease. So we go to the next slide. And uh, here are uh, some important uh, actors in the United States, FDA, CDC, GHSA. Um, this is the PREDICT framework. We go to the next slide. Uh, now here I have like two, three case studies with the US has helped in other countries, in Bangladesh, uh, in Cambodia, in DRC, they helped with a wildlife laboratory surveillance, agriculturals, educationists, uh, 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 laboratory technicians, training in epidemiology, surveillance, bringing all sectors together. And, um, you know, because these countries and these viruses are important. So, um, you know, there, there are a, a lot of documents which um, have them in detail as we go to the next slide. And uh, of course, within the United States, the CDC also has uh, done some important work. Um, they have a case study on salmonella infection, which was um, multi-drug resistant, um, and how they work with various um, agencies within the United States. And uh, the US often faces um, uh, um, bird flu and from migratory birds, wildlife birds, and, and CDC does document a number of these case studies. And we can go to the next slide. And yes, so, uh, you know, here we are um, on closing this now. What are the future directions uh, in this complex world? What are some of the challenges? Uh, the One Health is a huge concept. It requires tremendous uh, collaboration, uh, uh, technical collaboration. We need that kind of health force trained in epidemiology, AI, uh, wildlife health. And, um, you know, there are many challenges. Thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, I will take them. Thank you very much, Dr. Saxena, for sharing um, all your lecture and the insights. We already have one question um, that came in, so I will ask that question. But if you have any other questions, please feel free to write them in the chat, and I will ask them of Dr. Uh, Saxena. And the first one is from Ken. Um, I will say, I knew it was going to be from Ken. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> You know, um, and I'm going to ask the question, uh, if Ken, if that's OK, I'm going to add a couple points to it, because I think and if I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me as I ask the question. Right. So Ken is asking about our incidence of mass migrations also contributing to the spread of communicable diseases as borders are crossed and endemic disease as one of the as disease in one place arrives in a new state. So um, what I'm gathering from the question is as we see the movement of people. Right. And we know that people are moving in much higher levels today than really in any point of history, whether it's for job or immigration or any of those things. Am I correct on, on that way, on that thought process, Ken? So as we see that people are moving at more, at greater rates than any time in history, are these incidents of mass migration also contributing um, to, this, to this topic? Absolutely, yes. So uh, when in, in this world of travel, of trade, where every uh, destination in the world is just a few hours away, mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. And um, that is why, uh, you know, when, uh, when we um, 
uh, talk about infectious diseases and their spread. Uh, and we go through some of these four stages, which is, you know, when it when it is an outbreak, which is localized. Uh, there is an infection in one place. It, it is localized, and uh, and um, if it is a new disease, um, you know, there are ways. What we saw: contact tracing. Um, masks, wearing, quarantine, isolation, a lot of these uh, things are put in place and uh, we make an effort to control the disease, but uh, it doesn't because of the constant movement of people. And then it moves uh, to, you know, uh, maybe the country or the region as, as people are trans uh, moving from one place to other. And what we get are the epidemics which are not localized, but uh, within a region. Let's say the Zika was in the Americas or Ebola was in Africa. And, um, but what happens is that when, when it's not controlled at that, and if the virus is equally virulent, uh, you know, with a high R factor where it can multiply, and uh, you know, we, and if it's a new disease, you know, where you do not have an existing vaccine, you do not have an existing treatment, it it spreads globally, and uh, it that does not happen often. But we have uh, uh, the pandemic, which is which spread across the world in no time, the number of deaths, the number of cases. And yes, I mean, we have this entire debate on closing of borders, uh, all this surveillance at airports, uh, all, all this, yes, uh, I mean, uh, yes, mass migration of people. I mean, even during wars, even during natural disasters, we are constantly seeing people moving and, um, uh, uh, you know, and and in uh, if you talk of the pandemic, so it was in China around 2019 December. I think this disease became kind of prominent, and uh, but uh, even though we had a PHEIC, we did not get the WHO did not get to know about it immediately. But uh, I think by the end of December, uh, China had presented its case to WHO. Now we have to know that from. 1st of January till the 30th of January. Uh, it took a full month before WHO, the Director General and the Emergency Committee, which declares it a PHEIC, actually made a declaration of public health emergency of a national concern. That has been attributed to a whole lot of politics uh, and the decision making uh, there. And, and we have to know that it was 30th January and it took another month and a half in middle of March when it was declared a pandemic. By that time, it had spread. I mean, people had traveled all over the world within the United States. Um, you know, we, we are a federal state. So there were state level policies. There was federal policies and uh, 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 you know, uh, we did not have that kind of a coordinated response. Um, and um, yes, um, mass migration is important. Yes. So we have another question from Rob Jarreau. Um, and along the lines of COVID-19, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has prepared the world and the United States politicians, leaders, and medical community to be more effective in the future for responding and caring for people during future outbreaks? And he just added, and perhaps be able to prevent spread and cure, prevent spread and cure and treat people better and faster in the future, not just for COVID, but for other contagious diseases and viruses. Um, I would say uh, we hope so. And um, but uh, yes, uh, a number of good things, uh, you know, uh, that we saw during the pandemic, we saw a very fast development of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. It was a very quick response development of the vaccine. We saw development of diagnostic tools. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, medications uh, that came out. 
And um, while in the beginning, because we we were stumped, right? Um, and so was the whole world. It was what we call a newly emerging infectious disease. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, by the time the, the sequencing was done, and, and which was again a, a huge collaboration that we saw um, among the world. And um, so I think, uh, yes, we, we did see that level of cooperation. We, we do have COVAX, which is a vaccine initiative. And um, I, I think the Uni United States did, uh, did a good job after, you know, the initial, because it was a new virus, and and also we are a federation that was also in terms of coordinating policy as well as a state subject. So, uh, uh, and you know the entire issues of civil liberties and closures, all this sort of uh, got complicated. And uh, but um, um, the United States uh, is um, also a country where we saw a lot of you know we have an aging population. People have uh, a lot of people live very long, but with a lot of comorbidities. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore, the focus, again, is on non-communicable diseases. We also saw a sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a racial or, or, or an immigration category division when it comes to who, who got impacted. So issues of equity and equal distribution were raised. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yes, the U.S. is, I think, uh, ramping up this uh, One Health and public health. And one thing we have to again understand is that, uh, you know, we are as good as all the countries in the world. And, uh, you know, even though we had uh, the international health regulations, we had the global health security agenda, what we saw after the pandemic was that the countries were not well prepared. Mm -hmm. And, uh, some some of these demands require huge investments, you know, having all this high tech laboratories, surveillance and uh, managing databases and uh, just uh, stockpiling of these things. Sometimes they have poor uh, governance, there's corruption. And, and therefore, um, yes, uh, the world, ha uh, the U.S. can do much more in terms of, you know, helping the states uh, develop their capacities. Um, and of course, you know, the, we, we can't just blame it all on the United States. Uh, you know, there, there's this case study that I had read um, on distribution of vaccines that uh, um, even though, uh, you know, we did get vaccines through COVAX and we were able to uh, sell them, uh, this is a serum ink uh, based in India. They're the biggest vaccine manufacturers of the world. And they were selling vaccines at a really very low price through COVAX facilities. But there were a number of countries um, in, in Africa uh, where the leaders did not want to even pay that much for the vaccines. Uh, so what, what we are seeing is, um, you know, a complexity of the world and that's why I want to, I brought up the issue of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we cannot dictate uh, policies. We can just get them to cooperate, get them to collaborate. We have all the geopolitics uh, about sharing of information. I mean, countries were very reluctant to share their data. Some of the data that we have on COVID-19 from a number of countries, we don't even know if it's, you know, in terms of reporting of those diseases because uh, it impacts their image, their investments countries are making in them, travel, tourism. Uh, so the, these are also embroiled in politics. And um, yeah, so health really has become uh, you know, it's more than environment, more than people, um, more than human beings, uh, more than the intergovernmental organizations and efforts. Politics is important. Governance is important. And uh, so 
we can make the best of efforts and I think in terms of science and technology and AI, which has been used, uh, you know, for predicting the next patterns of pathogens. Mm. Yeah, all these advances um, and, and the individual who has become more aware. I think uh, it was considered to be a problem of the low and low middle income countries, infectious diseases. But now we know that, uh, you know, Nobody is far away from a virus or a bacteria in any part of the world. So this is, is it is a global responsibility. It's our individual responsibility also for behavioral and personal hygiene questions. Thank you. And um, um, we have one more question from Ken, um, and then I'll ask the question, and then I'll say a couple things for the next community conversations. Um, so Ken is asking, are there efforts in the public health community that address the rise of the political right around the world? For example, like America First, which is basically not cooperative. Uh, efforts in the public health community, uh, yes, the public health community is uh, making a lot of efforts. I mean, we provide the workforce, uh, they are the front line at the hospitals, uh, at the communities, um, often they are uh, you know, working with the agricultural community and, and so on. Um, there's a lot of focus on universal health coverage. There is a lot of focus on public health uh, preparedness. Uh, um, yes, and uh, the question on America first. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, I would say a, no, a difficult question to answer because uh, you know when uh, it I saw this in every country of the world mm -hmm. I saw it in every country of the world that uh, you know when something like the, a disease like this happens you know people feel that their country's first responsibility to is to their people is to their people, you know, when it comes to personal protection equipment, sharing of uh, vaccines. Um, so yes, people of the country first. Um, 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 it was um, in India also, I saw it was hit by a second wave of COVID. Um, some of the vaccine manufacturers had to halt their exports to other countries. There was tremendous political pressure to give it to their own people. Uh, but yes, uh, I think um, while we take care of our nations and our countries, we know that uh, we cannot live in isolation. You know, we are dependent on supply chains. We are dependent on uh, cooperation from scientists um, and, um, you know, the world needs to be healthy for each one of us to be healthy. So, yes, it, it is important, collaboration and cooperation. And yes, if you are rich and well-developed, uh, why not? And, and in, like when we talk of global health, we always say that there are three issues. One which guided is humanitarian, uh, issues of equity, and self-interest also. We, we cannot take one, give more preference uh, or sort of denigrate the other. Uh, mm -hmm. th these are the realities and complexities of the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Saxena, for sharing about One Health and about the global health initiatives. I know one of the things I've learned from you throughout this process, Dr. Saxena and I met multiple times. And one thing that I'm really taking away um, and learned from you is how we all need to work together to stay healthy. I never thought of it that way until you shared that with me. So thank you for sharing that and for that perspective on we all need to work together for us to stay healthy. Thank you.
Um, our next session, um, so thank you all for joining us today for Community Conversations. Our next session, um, actually Dr. Brian Dixon is here on our call. He will be one of our presenters. We will be reviewing the film Don't Look Up. It will be our first in-person session ever. Community Conversations turns one year old next month. So uh, we are just a one year old um, program, um, but we will have our first session in person and we will um, provide an update on how that will work as we develop it. So if you have any interest in that, please feel free to let me know. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us here and I wish you all a happy Friday and a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you everyone for coming thank to you. this session. Thank you.